Let's take a look at the effect of oxygen on the growth of bacteria. That's exercise 24 in the newer lab manual. If you have an older version, it was number 19 before. Um, to start out, uh, we need to take a look at some definitions. Um, the oxygen requirement basically defines which um, group of bacterium they belong to by these definitions here. Um, if we have an obligate or strict aerobic bacterium, these bacteria must grow in oxygen because their metabolism requires oxygen. So they must have oxygen, therefore obligate aerobes or strict aerobics. Um, <clears throat> microaerophiles. And these bacteria, they prefer oxygen concentrations that are below what we normally find in the atmosphere. So microaerophiles, they like somewhere between 2 to 10% oxygen rather than the 20% that we have in our atmosphere. Facultative anaerobes, um, they are flexible and they can they grow very well aerobically, but they also can switch over to anaerobic growth. And so they, are, um, they um, have options and therefore this is a um, bacterium that's just uh, able to grow just about in any environment. Uh, then we have aerotolerant anaerobes. These anaerobes, they tolerate oxygen and even grow in its presence, but they do not require oxygen for energy production. So they, um, they can tolerate oxygen, but and they don't die in the presence of oxygen, but um, they don't need oxygen for their energy production. And then we have the obligate anaerobes or strict anaerobes. To them, oxygen is literally toxic. Um, they typically lack enzymes that will get rid of toxic forms of oxygen and so therefore um, they typically cannot grow if there's any oxygen around. Any aerobic bacterium that grows well in the presence of oxygen um, has enzymes that will get rid of toxic forms of oxygen. The most important one here would be catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that gets rid of toxic forms of oxygen, such as peroxides, uh, that could be damaging to cells. And um, anaerobic bacteria typically don't have catalase, and so therefore toxic forms of oxygen are literally toxic to them and can damage their DNA and other cellular components. Other enzymes that are important will be peroxidase uh, that also gets rid of uh, peroxide and then we have superoxide dismutase. Taking a look at figure 24.1, the oxygen needs um, of microorganisms you file in a, a growth tube. Um, you will find aerobic bacteria on top. They want to be close to the oxygen that's up here on, on top of the growth medium. Uh, the microaerophiles, you will find some in the middle. They're kind of so closer to the top, but they really don't want to be all the way up there where there's so much oxygen. And then your strict anaerobes, uh, they're way on the bottom, farthest away from any kind of surface where there would be oxygen. Now, growing anaerobes, in an environment where there's so much oxygen in the air uh, can be tricky. And so if you wanted to grow anaerobes, um, there are a couple ways you can go about this. A popular way and something that we have in the lab and you would have gotten to do to use is the anaerobic jar. It's called the gas pack anaerobic jar because we have to put a gas pack in there that releases hydrogen and carbon dioxide where the hydrogen then um, bonds with the oxygen to form water and that gets rid of the oxygen that was in the jar. That's also on that video clip that I posted for you on Canvas, uh, somebody demonstrating how to use the gas pack anaerobic jar. So once you're streaking out your organisms on plates right here, uh, you will place the, the gas pack in there, um, activate it, and um, you also will put an indicator strip in there and this indicator strip is usually methylene blue. Methylene blue is blue when it's exposed to oxygen and it loses its color when it's in anaerobic conditions. So as soon as the gas pack has removed all of the oxygen in the jar, then your test strip will turn white or it loses its blue color and um, then you know you have anaerobic conditions. You gotta make sure that you have an airtight lid up here it doesn't let any oxygen back into the 
into the jar and then you have anaerobic growth conditions um, that's exactly what we would have done in the lab I would have asked you to streak out some different types of bacteria on these plates and then we would have placed um, these uh, stacks of agar uh, uh, petri plates into the anaerobic jar and let them grow for two days and then see which organisms can grow in these anaerobic conditions another popular way of um, growing anaerobes is with different media um, liquid media that um, remove oxygen in the medium so we have reducing agents usually in there and then you will inoculate uh, the bacteria and in order to minimize the amount of air that go goes in rather than shaking up the tube and exposing the medium to oxygen uh, you would roll it between your hands so that you're mixing the bacteria without mixing in a lot of oxygen from the atmosphere so here's how the lab is structured um, you would have gotten three different types of media to work with um, the first one is a fluid medium that stays fluid and so that's called a fluid thioglycolate medium um, FTM abbreviated and that one has a reducing uh, chemical and agent in it that provides an anaerobic type of um, environment for bacteria to grow uh, no need to put it into any anaerobic jar or anything like that just the bacteria just the FTM itself will provide the anaerobic condition still anaerobic bacteria they will stay away from the top where there's some exposure to the atmosphere that contains oxygen then the TGYA shake tubes and they are liquefied so they're like deeps that are melted and once they um, cool down to room temperature or, or incubator temperature they will solidify like we've had before so they get inoculated while the medium is um, liquefied and then um, they solidify and then you have basically a deep and then the petri plates that would have gone into the anaerobic jar that's called brewers anaerobic agar um, those plates I would have asked you to streak out bacteria and then you have um, streaks of those bacteria and we would have grown them in the anaerobic jar we have six different types of bacteria for this lab and um, you would have been assigned to one group of three or the other uh, group A of three bacteria is uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Enterococcus faecalis and Clostridium sporogenes. Uh, group B, those three bacteria would have contained Bacillus subtilis, E. coli, and Clostridium rubrum. That's the one that we have in the lab. And um, you should have done this in groups so that uh, you can see the results from group A and group B um, on your table groups. So whichever set of three bacteria you would have been assigned to, you would have taken those three bacteria and inoculate three tubes of FTM medium, the liquid one, then three TGYA sh shake tubes with those three that you were assigned to, and then on the single Petri plate that you should have used, uh, you would have made three a row of uh, three rows of bacteria. So, so let's say you would have assigned been assigned to group B bacteria then you would have played it bacillus subtilis one row right here e coli that should have been the middle row then and clostridium rubrum that would have been the third row here the example is given a little bit differently um, here they played it out bacillus subtilis clostridium rubrum and clostridium sporogenes and i put down here what they are so bacillus all the bacillus species they're all strictly aerobic bacteria and um they would have not grown at all in the anaerobic jar. Um, then a strict anaerobe, of course, would have loved the environment in the anaerobic jar, and um, you should have seen a nice streak of growth of this Clostridium. Now, Clostridium sporogenes, all the Clostridia are um, anaerobes. Some of them, however, are a little bit aerotolerant, uh, but either way, um, the Clostridium, both of the Clostridia should have grown in the anaerobic jar in that environment. 
Here are the expected results for the fluid thioglycolate tubes. Again, um, that's a liquid medium. It stays liquid. It has chemicals inside that provide an anaerobic environment. Just on the very top, you can always see that it turns uh, kind of orange-reddish. And that is because once the medium gets exposed to oxygen, there's an indicator and it turns it red. Um, here is sort of the uh, what you would have expected with the different gross uh, oxygen requirements of bacteria. Test tube number A is a control just to make sure that nothing is growing if we don't want it to grow. And um, test tube number B is a microaerophile. You can see that the bacteria are growing in this section right here, sort of um, below the surface. Uh, they don't want to get too close to the surface, but you have quite a bit of growth, so right around just below the surface right there. Then in test tube number C, that's the typical growth that you see with a strict aerobic bacterium. It hates this medium. It really doesn't want to grow. If anything, there might be a slim layer right here on the very top, just um, gasping for some oxygen right there. And then um, on test tube number D, uh, we have the anaerobe. Uh, they like to grow all throughout the medium right here. You can see growth from here to here, just not real close to the surface because there's a little bit of oxygen up there and they can't take it. And then um, test tube number E shows facultative anaerobes. They can grow either way. They grow all the way through the entire length of this test tube. They grow with oxygen, with little oxygen, with no oxygen. It doesn't matter to them. They can grow either way. Here's a more close-up view of the kind of expected growth that you should have found in these FTM um, test tubes. On A, we have the facultative anaerobe growing all over the place. That would be test tube A. And then test tube number B, aerobic bacteria just on the very top, just this very top layer right there. And then on test tube number C, anaerobe, that one will not grow close to the surface, but anywhere else they will grow. And down here, um, this one shows a close-up of the um, microaerophile, which likes to grow just here. So it needs a little bit of oxygen, but can't grow all the way to the bottom and really doesn't want to be too close to the top either. Let's take a look at the other results. And um, let's skip down here to number two. The plate inoculation should have given you the following results. E. coli and Staph aureus. I put that over here because I ran out of space. Uh, Staph aureus and E. coli are both facultative anaerobic bacteria in their growth requirement. Enterococcus faecalis is aerotolerant anaerobic. And uh, Bacillus subtilis is a strict aerobic bacterium and both of the Clostridia, Clostridium sporogenes and Clostridium rubrum are strict anaerobes. Knowing this information, you can just kind of draw in um, what you would have seen on your FTM medium, the fluid thioglycolate medium. Um, you can do that for your lab report for your uh, logbook entry. I don't really have a pen to do this right here. And uh, the spore study, you don't have to know. You don't have to worry about it. And let's answer quickly those questions here at the end. Uh, what's the role of oxygen for cellular respiration? So anytime a uh, organism can use oxygen, that means it utilizes it as its as a final electron acceptor. It's usually a more efficient way of making um, ATP, so cellular energy. So typically, um, bacteria that can utilize oxygen, they grow faster because they have more energy available. Number two, what type of metabol metabolism occurs in the absence of oxygen? That's called fermentation, something that we're going to talk more about in lecture. On three, name two enzymes that are present in obligate aerobes but lacking in obligate anaerobes. And um, that will be catalase and peroxidase. Both of these enzymes, catalase and peroxidase, they will break down peroxide into water and oxygen and thereby removing the um, highly reactive peroxide that could be damaging to cells. Four, the uh, difference between the microaerophiles and the aerotolerant organisms is that microaerophiles still need a little bit of oxygen. They don't like as much as we have in your atmosphere, but they still need some oxygen for their metabolism. The aerotolerant organisms cannot use any oxygen for their met metabolism. They may tolerate some oxygen, but they cannot utilize it at all.
skipping down to six the um, brewer's anaerobic agar plates they needed to be grown in the um, gas pack anaerobic jar because the gas pack was removing the oxygen thereby providing this anaerobic environment for the ftm fluid medium you didn't need to do that because the um, thioglycolate removes the oxygen and provides the anaerobic environment